like um like a race car you know one of us drives while the other one fixes the tires and does the oil and then every once in a while we flip i feel like i'm on jerry springer yeah (laughs) we haven't watched tv in 28 years 29 years it's funny we get people like do you ever see that one show we're like no Seriously, like, we have not watched TV. And when we go to other people's houses where the TV's on, it's like... Um, it's annoying. We we feel like the personal connection is gone, you know? like it sounds... It's like a background thing, and, like, people get used to that background. And- well, the conversations with people that watch a program, and they go, this is real. Like, no, there's a guy filming it. My mom's there's way a, into there's a, Survivor uh, and, uh, you know, The Voice and all these shows where they're... Um, they are real to probably uh, uh, an ambulance sitting right there, or, or EMTs in case something gets wrong, you know, and somebody gets bit by this alligator. So, don't tell me it's real. <laughs> well, it is real to a certain extent. Yes, right? but they have a safety net right there. It's not like you're out there by yourself. Most of the time that people do the out there by themselves thing, there's no way to film it. Because your your battery's probably dead, and <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of people don't know that they don't know that this was built. This tower was built in 1933 by the CCCs. There were no roads here, Dylan. They had to hike. They didn't they had helicopter in these these beams that, that they built. This they they milled them on site. You know, no, so, this was a kit. A kit, yes. yeah. But a lot of stuff they made. And so mm-hmm. the point is, if we can get to uh, thousands of people that say, hey park service hey forest service hey whoever agency blm these places are worth saving for generations to come they're they're not only important in fire detection but they're important in so many people think they're neat so that's what's changed our mindset we feel like we need to tell people like why they need to be responsive or why they need to tell their friends or their uh who whoever they need to uh, spread the message that we want to save these structures. A lot of the Forest Service misses the point that the reason we want to these places to exist is beyond the fire detection. It's the cultural heritage, and, and, and it's our American heritage that a lot of people don't know. We can talk about the, um, the lookouts that were built on the Oregon coast in the 1930s. They were built as fire lookouts. They were watching for aircraft. They were called aircraft warning stations. They were AWS. AWS stations. All the people that staffed those aircraft warning stations, they were women with kids because all the men were off on the in the war. And there were no stayed through the winter. So they stayed through the winter. There'd be 20 feet of snow, and the yeah. women would raise their children in these lookouts. Like that's another story in itself, right? I mean, it's just like so cool. <laughs> here today with Joey and Shannon Hodgson. Thank you guys for joining us today. We're here at uh, Round Mountain Lookout. Kind of see around us and see how beautiful this place is. Did I say that right? Yes. Round Mountain? Yes. Awesome. Thank you guys for being here. Appreciate it. Yeah. Good to meet you, man. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me up here. The best part is that we met a year ago briefly and we stayed in touch and this is awesome. We have. Where'd you guys grow up? Did you grow up in the same area? I grew up on the Oregon coast near Nesco End. And I grew up on Mount Hood uh, in a town called Estacada. And they call it the Clackamas River. Uh, run, run. It's kind of the end of the line, um, but close to Portland, but um, still in, in the woods. Mm-hmm. 
we had all those uh, things that you could imagine in the country, which is, you know, uh, garden nope yeah. swing. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, I had a pretty idyllic uh, childhood with um, always out in the woods. When, when I was uh, about 15, I, I had taken a home study class on on uh, forest ecology and conservation. So I, back when I was a kid, I had a fascination with the forest. And I, um, but when I got my apprenticeship out of high school, um, you know, my life changed and I learned, I had this big apprenticeship um, and moved to the city. And, but I always, always loved the forest. Um, when I was a kid, I went on a backpacking trip with a, with another family. And when we, hiked up the ridge and I could see this fire lookout and I was 12 and I thought man that is the coolest thing and then um you know I just thought maybe someday I could be in a fire lookout there was a person there um and uh he was actually a trail uh trail ranger so his job was to to go around and you know improve trail talk to talk to visitors and um you know, about etiquette for camping and stuff and backpacking. And then when there was lightning or uh, possibility of fire, he would be in the tower. Oh, wow. Well, that's super interesting. And did you have a similar experience or something different? My grandfather worked in the Forest Service, and my uncle actually was a lookout at Cougar Mountain Lookout. Yeah, I never went there. And in, in fact, until I became a lookout, no one even really told me that story. It was kind of one of those, oh, well, your Uncle Keith was one, too. Like, well, how come you guys didn't tell me that before? <laughs> but your Uncle Keith did so many different things. He did just one season in a lookout, but he was a, a forestry um, student. And there's a similarity that's there, and you, you didn't even know that it existed until later. <laughs> that's that's wild. Isn't it? Yeah. So you had almost two two family members that mm-hmm. kind of lived around the, mm-hmm. the forest. Wow, that's super interesting. The only reason I ask is just a lot of people, you know, if they're bankers or if they're artists or if they're, you know, forest workers, they tend to have like some kind of, you know, tie to a person that um, helped introduce it's them. Or inspire yeah. to do something uh, that may they may have done. Or, or It's almost, it's just like these stepping stones that lead you and you think it, if, and if you had know, gone the other way, your life would be totally different. But, you know, they kind of are linked somehow. And if it wasn't for that family that took me on that backpacking trip, I'd have never seen a lookout and I wouldn't be sitting here today, you know? So like these experiences and choices that you make in life, really, um, they direct you on the path that you end up going on. And, you know, and we, as a married couple, we've We've done some adventures. We've thought about (laughs) choices and like we've made, we've made, you know, the reason we're here today is because we've made specific choices that were decisions that we all have to make in life and like where do you want to be um you know and no regret and so like right now happy this is, this is where we want to be right now hey that's that's something not many people can say is yeah. this is where they belong you know, yeah that's that's winning and it's not about making a lot of money it's being happy i didn't see the porsche down down in, well, the, in the driveway i have one it's this big okay. <laughs> it's about the size of the ferrari i have too yes <laughs> did you guys meet through the forest in some way or was there yeah, a... that's a negative. totally different <laughs> yeah would you like so my other grandfather was owned a print shop mm-hmm. and he started out as an apprentice working at a print shop paper printing Business cards, letterhead, fancy cards. Well, I was an engraver, so, so I, he was the engraver. I, I learned it. I was one of the last people to be working there first. Grand trade. Then, I had never even been to where my grandfather had this because he was already retired by the time I was kind of grown up, and always had a curiosity, like you know, I want to see Grandpa's shop. So after he passed away, my family uh, organized a tour of the facility. And when I got done, I said, I, I want to work here. And they're like, you know, but why? Like, aren't, aren't you like wealthy? Your grandfather used to own this place. Like, no, <laughs> we're not. And yeah, this is something I'm interested in. So he was already working there and I started working there. But but there's a great story behind that because and I you could have bet me a thousand dollars that there's no way I'm going to marry that goof that's over in the 
engraving shop. No way. It was wild. The funny part is that we had a sign parking. We had a we sign had a sign parking, parking spaces, spot. and guess who had the and, park, right? Not only and so and I had this Volkswagen Beetle, right? I had the I had the seventy four uh, Super, Super Beetle, and I had a seventy two. She had the seventy two. Anyways, the first time I ever laid eyes on her. I pulled up in the morning to go to work, and I pulled into my assigned spot, and here comes the new girl, and she's got a Volkswagen, too. We both look at each other, and I think at that moment, I think, I'm going to marry that girl. Like, I know that <laughs> she's the one. Like, it was instantaneous, and um, and then- It took course, him three years to even get me to go out. We three were, years it, 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 yeah I was, I was almost every night after work he's like so when are you gonna go out with me and i'd be like uh never dude i'm you know, getting in my car like, so, you know I, I, so one day i said yes and he's like you know falls against his car like and, what you're gonna my, go out with me tonight my parameters were <laughs> i'm feeling reckless i i had to ask her on wow, the first day and perseverance said, man you gotta respect that <laughs> Wore me down. <laughs> how how did he wear you down over three years? What made you? Yes. I'm, kept I'm a asking me, person. and he kept asking me. But I think it was kind of like I want to make sure he was genuine. You know, are you for real? Are you being serious? Or are you? Is this just something for fun? You know. And it turned out he was serious. You know, we're going on <laughs> twenty nine years. But I. But I wasn't what? gonna be into it if she didn't. I had this parent. He had a stipulation. And, uh, the first date, I said, uh, you know. Because I absolutely love picking berries, and we pick, <laughs> I pick you know strawberries and raspberries, but we go out in the woods and we pick huckleberries and we've picked kanikanik and we've done all kinds of different berries that are out there. But so I asked her on a date, and I said, and she said, "Well, where are we going to go?" And I was like, "If she says no, then she's not the girl for me." <laughs> and I said, "We're going to go pick berries," and she was like. Yeah. Heck yeah. And I was like, okay, baby. Yeah. I was going. And, and I knew then it was like, uh, that was, uh, she was for, she was the one for me. So um, that's our story. Um, there's a lot more to it. There is the more to it. And, uh, but the, he, he, he can play the piano, which impressed me. And he runs a chainsaw. <laughs> that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to have somebody that can. Take, take so she the logs out of her rope. Really really That's incredible. I'm just trying to paint a picture in my head, and I, I get maybe you were sort of a, a. Oh, I was a wild card, and I had been to Alaska uh, fishing. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I guess I kind of ran away from society at some point. I, I had this apprenticeship, and I, uh, and I worked for years um, to get to be a journeyman. You know, in engraving. So I was one of the youngest engravers. Um, which is how you print money. You know, it's basically you yeah. You have a Money's die and great. you roll ink over it and then you smash it down on a platen press and there's nothing more uh, primitive about it. Makes a lot of noise. Um, but like, <laughs> so, but there's no young people that know how to do it and, and yeah. now it's a non-career. You, you know, so the other bizarre part of this story, once he met his real father, he owns a print shop. <laughs> He thinks he may have actually apply, applied for a but, job but that's there. that's a whole other story. My last job was at a place called Creative Paper Crafting. So we did the off-the-wall things, which is kind of the, our story. Like, our life has been always, like, weird. Like, who's an engraver? Unusual. And it was a dying trade. You know, take the A and put it in there and then slide it over. The like, old style, which is super interesting. Um, and I found it really cool. And then it's a platen press, so, you know, you, you roll ink over a die or the type, and then you take the paper goes in and you actually smack it. And the difference, it's like between, rubber stamping, only with metal. If you look at all the yeah, laser yeah. printers in the world, um, the thing is, it's you can't feel it on the paper. So, like, it's or so if cool. you turn it over, there's no indent that you can see the back right. of it. If it's so been it's, when you see something foil stacked or embossed, is that what, way, and the, when the paper is bumped up, and you can feel that, we think that's super super cool because you can't there's no technology that can do it, it computers to can't do it it has down. to be physically anyway, squished would it be fair to say you, you enjoyed some of that work well, the creative Create side of side it. but after you've done about 40 pallets of something you're kind of over doing it you know 
when I first started engraving, it was all death certificates and birth certificates and lawyers' letter. They so, keep an eye on you if you're doing that kind of stuff. The thing about the job, I give that, you fifty, you bring fifty back. If it's messed up, you show me you're messed up, boy, because you can change who you are with one of those. The thing <laughs> about it is, there's a lot of creativity. It's really a cool career, um, but for us personally, you're inside of a building. With so there's a windows. commute to wherever you're wherever you're at and loud a lot of times there's no windows and earplugs um, earplugs and, and we're dealing paper, with chemical paper dust and uh, paper dust we we love deadlines but with the printing industry it pushed you to the limit week after week with the same hurry do this hurry do this and then sometimes they, you would get it done and then you'd come in monday morning and that box is still sitting there you're like you like, what you could have done was hid that from me. You work Saturday. Said I had to have it done, and it's still sitting there. You know, and if you do like terrible 500 envelopes or something that are really cool, you're like, you're really proud of what you did. But when it comes to be 50,000 envelopes, it's a chore. So you have to open open the flap so you get to where it runs without. They have these lengths. And yet we're like, shut them. Oh, I'm pretty good at flapping them shut. Yeah. And you know, and like, you know, jogging big. Paper, it take it's a technique, you know, and then flipping through and finding I mistakes. I think we both have goofed up thumbs from that because yeah. you've got to squeeze and jog it all together, and that stacking jogging thing is. But we had enough of that. Your thumbs out. I had enough of that at that time of my life. I was going up to fire lookout towers, and I was going to mountains that had fire lookout towers, and then I was even going to mountains that didn't. I was just always, and it wasn't necessarily crampons and you know climbing gear but a lot of it was scrambling up these peaks for the view and we would go so we would take a picnic when we first were dating and we would take and actually we had a you know an actual picnic box and we'd take wine and our and we would climb these peaks and we'd get to the top and we'd have a lunch and uh and uh we would enjoy the view and th- and then we would think and I would tell her you know when I was a kid I I saw this fire lookout tell me and like like wouldn't that be cool and all the while trying to convince and me. And we were like, but we're but we're doing you pretty think? good with our with this? our printing thing, but but how good is the printing thing? And then we had a near death experience. But, but we had rented a fire lookout before that, Picket Butte, back when they started renting them in the eighties. And we stayed there over the weekend and I remember thinking I wonder what it's like to be to here work here all to, to to spend a whole I had summer. those thoughts like I was looking at the maps and things and, you know, just that whole, hmm, wonder what it's like. Here I am. <laughs> it's uh, definitely not for everybody. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons why people wouldn't want to do this. Mm-hmm. There's an outhouse. Outhouse is one of the things you're like, oh, that's gross. Like, well, can you take a shower every day? Well, no. Well, not every day. Shower bag. But, but you know, there's wind, there's bees, you know, there's reasons why you don't shower on particular days. Shower every day. But, if you, you know, the, the sun shower, it, it's, it's, you doable. have to haul all your water by hand. And, um, you, what else? You're signed up for the whole summer. You have we, no time off. We miss things. People invite us to dinner all the time in the summer. No, we can't make it to dinner. One of us can. If there's but weddings or, you know, the yeah. job is. Yeah. The job's not for everybody and it, and it pays. Um, Some people get bored. It's, it's very low pay. We don't get bored. <laughs> We're but, talking minimum wage type pay. This is what they call a 1039 appointment. So. 1039 means it's 1,039 hours. But why is it 1039? Because if it's 1040, they'd have to give us insurance and benefits. But 1039 is one hour, is one hour under. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it it, it's it, it's one of the things. Um, it has been a great, I, I, I would just say this in, in a few sentences, it has been a great career choice. But financially, it hasn't been. Um, we could have made a lot more money and I still could make a lot more money doing other things but as Shannon mentioned life is not about money it, it's really about friends family love and experiences and experiences adventures. and having peace in your life where there's not so much drama and I can't stress that enough people like you know find a simple way to live because uh 
because being angry about things is just no way to be or, or just uptight about stuff you know so, or uh, concerned you know concerned is a is a very big stress <laughs> and and also you need time in nature you know and so uh, yeah that whole nature deficit and, thing not suffering from yeah, it and, and, <laughs> you know get out there in the morning and get your eyes take your sunglasses off because that's when you get benefits uh, vitamin d from the sun in the morning and a lot of people know this but like you do it man you'll feel better yeah did you ever feel like that anxiety that you're not making you know enough money or you're not making sometimes we wonder if we're gonna make it but we've we've worked this balance out pretty well yeah but but you have a different opinion than I do. Of it. Always. <laughs> so I don't feel like she yeah. does about it. I I we're, we're, it's the counter. You, you don't have the same personality and no, desires and no, opinions. No. I'm, Just I'm blown same, away. Same middle initial. Uh, no, I I uh, I look at where my age and I look at the fact that my retirement is not. I don't have retirement and what I do. What we do have, we've worked really hard to save for and we've made pennies on this job i mean we've worked for pennies and we have had so much stress um you have no idea what it's like to be a modern fire lookout in an urban interface set setting with the expectations that have just gone up and up and up every year and now we are expected to live up to our own expectations which is pretty hard we set the bar too high for ourselves <laughs> and so financially it hasn't been well, good we strive to to do well to you know the firefighters on the ground trust us yeah and, and we have skin in the game so we call it skin in the game so say you want to do a fire lookout here and you're from california so you come up for a season and you may be really good at the job and you may enjoy it but you're probably going to go back to california and you don't live here so you don't have as much skin in like the game. Your house you're isn't down there to right up to here with everybody else. <laughs> Tourism in a way, right? Yeah. Yeah. For someone to come in and then leave again. But you live you live here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there we, we want this different. to not burn up. <laughs> um but don't you know, don't mistake that we need fire in the forest. It's it's a part of a natural system. And um we have to realize that and that um, you know, when you see bug kill pine for thousands or hundreds of miles it's a natural thing and it was that way a million years ago if you want to believe but what's different now is that we've built our permanent houses here you know the native people they had their they, baby they, or their temporary know. spot and they would go other so places we but the fires to we built these permanent places out. and now here comes the fire like well now we have to clean around this and, and so we, we, we need fires. We just don't need the mega fires that we've been getting. And so, and you know, it's a whole uh, debate over the fire science and fire ecology. And um, what really gets me is that people say we need to solve this problem, like solving homelessness. Well, we can't solve homelessness, but we can mitigate homelessness. So we can mitigate these fires. We can, we can have a plan, you know, but we're never going to solve the wildfire it's almost it's just it, it makes me laugh every time i hear a reporter say well how are we going to solve hope we're going to fix this like you no know, you can't but you can it's fire you come, come to san francisco and see if they've actually fixed homelessness with all the uh but we can mitigate it and we can try to do good things right and we can and we can look at mental health and we can put some money towards all that stuff the intent same, is good same with fire we can do all these things once you, we they know where it is, then they can decide what to do with it. And that's what we do. And that's part of what we do. We tell them where it's it is. It's early detection. so And it's small, so they have time usually to make a decision. It's when it's detected when it's already 40 acres that we're concerned. And, and when you're talking <laughs> about camera, a little harder to deal with when it's already 30 <laughs> acres. <laughs> Makes total sense. Well, yes. A lot of the cameras and AI, a lot of times we're talking about fires that are one acre to five acres to 20 acres to 40 to 100 acres before someone goes, oh my God, I see a fire in the camera, you know. Well, we're right now. We're today. You can call me on the phone and go, hey, there's a fire on Day Road. It just happened 30 seconds ago and I just happened to be looking with my binoculars and went hey there's a fire there and I spin my Osborne around and I know exactly where it is because I know where Day Road is and I can be like hey dispatch there's a fire on Day Road 
And there's no camera that can touch that, you know? And so, but we can work with technology and use it, but why should we eliminate the human factor? There should be both. Why, not only are we faster and mostly better than the technology, but there's the cultural heritage of these places, and especially here at Round Mountain. This is a 90-year-old facility. It's going to be 90 years old. Yeah. And how cool is that? Next month. And people can come here and celebrate, you know, the fact that um, we didn't let this place rot away. We didn't burn it up. Um, it's still an active fire station. How cool is that? Are there other things that fire watchers do besides just look out for fires? Like, is there any, you know? Absolutely. Yes. We talk to the public that shows up. Hikers. Uh, we listen We listen to the, the Forest Service radio and we help it's with- almost like professional eavesdropper, like- certain times someone will call and no one else gets through or they'll be out they'll be able to check out in the wilderness and they're in their their conversation what they're saying is real scratchy well we've been listening to that scratchy radio for so long and all these people's voices and we know who it is we know who it is and probably what they're saying we can decipher that scratchy radio and sometimes we have said dispatch that's johnson and she's on a trail and needs help, okay. you know? We can decipher it because we've been listening to it so long. And it's like a language. We know, exactly, we know exactly where that person is. We we know she's From on the three sisters. She's on the find it on the map. Trail, on three sisters wilderness. We we look at the map and we know where that person is. And so we, we actually keep track of people when they're out there. It's not part of our job, but that's what we do. Part of just We're, to be helpful for the and, whole picture. And not only that, we have... Um, weather stations here uh, we have what we call basic fire weather observations which is the same thing that a firefighter will do once they get a fire you have a sling psychrometer and we take basic fire weather observations every half an hour um there's also hard um hard weather stations they call it a raw like remote, remote remote automated, automated weather, weather station yeah yeah <laughs> um and, and so the it, weather it's like a jungle gym and it, it, it's it, yeah. How important is it, Shannon, to know Super the weather? Super important. Knowing the temperature, the humidity, and the wind, speed, and direction uh, is way and important for firefighters. Um, there's certain measurements. Firefighter safety is another thing. You know, the, the storms that come through, we let them know when it's near them. We let them know when we're seeing lightning and rain or wind being kicked up. And then they can retreat to their vehicles for safety if need be, or even totally leave the area if need be. Another thing that we do is when we have cumulus buildup and there's going to be thunderstorms, we can watch these clouds build up and there's nothing more primal. Um, there's nothing <laughs> yeah, more primal. Watching it just go. Watch, and, and you know, everybody, fire. everybody's seen it in their life. They've seen those beautiful clouds. And when they're when they're not defined, it's probably not going to happen. But when you see that cauliflower appearance, it looks like sharp cauliflower, and then it goes vertical and it has, a, has a dark bottom. You know, and there's a little virgo, which is a little bit of moisture hanging down. Yeah, we've all seen it. And then all of a sudden, you you get the lightning. Well, we can watch it build up, and we know which way those storms are tracking, so we can tell our dispatch, "Hey, dispatch, the storm," you know, or we can tell them this has light precip or moderate precip, so they can. The ground crews can adjust their positions, or if there is a fire, because they can get um, wind bursts, you know, from these thunderstorms. Even if they don't produce lightning, these they keep the wind them. in front they of them. Can, they have a front in front of them, and so if there's a fire, it can cause fire whirls. And so a camera can't tell you. It's that. for their safety. There's the, no the satellite that can tell you that. Only a you know, but not and the there is radar that we even watch on, on our iPads about the lightning and the where the clouds are. But while they're building, before they get to a certain size, they don't show up. So we can tell our dispatch or the firefighters, this is where they're starting to build. You're not gonna see it on your screen yet because they're not big enough, but we know where they're building. And you know, say we've got a whole row of them over here and nothing over there, we can say, well, they look like they're building up on the crest. So that's where we need to kind of move crew or focus because that's probably where it's going to happen. And then later, once they get bigger, then they show up 
on the iPad. So we're kind of like, you know, we're, we're the ahead of time watching for them. And you have other senses too. You can smell and, and hear things and absolutely you feel. Yeah. Things yeah. There's that some other the, things that we do is look out. So we, you do a lot of public outreach because that's how Joey and I met you. Yes. You and I met in the forest yeah. and you brought me to the fire tower. You, I didn't know anything about fire. So, you know, you, you kind of showed me how the tower works and how forest fires start. And yeah, and here we are doing a podcast because of <laughs> that interaction. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty interesting. And early in our career, we were um, not opposed to public contact, but we were, we were afraid that the more that people knew about these places, the more that um, they would come up and vandalize or possibly um, do some harm to them. And you know what? It was a, valid concern but you know what people are mostly good and so I like to think that um, in terms of a positive aspect and so as the years went by I've changed my mindset and I think you have too yeah and um, we realized that um, not necessarily exploiting a place like you don't want to go to Yellowstone and go this particular trail is so awesome on YouTube everybody go here Woo-hoo! you know and then you have millions of people on that trail that's so it's that is that. Like, so we've changed our mindset in the fact that the public, um, we want, actually what I want personally is that I would like to think, and I don't have children, but I would like to think 50 years from now, or even when you look at 100 years from now, that there'll still be a person and people will still be coming up, showing their kids how awesome the forest is and how all this wildlife and how we're all interconnected on earth and how it really matters to save our heritage, um, not only as Americans, but as humans, um, to save what is here and not just think that, um, exploit it for, you know, commercial value. Like, let's not put banners on the side of buildings. You know, you don't want to go into a national park and see a, a bus that's advertising Pepsi. It like, you know, this is p- perhaps my viewpoint, but what I would like to see is a hundred years from now, when you go to Crater Lake, you have the same experience that I had as a kid, and you see those squirrels, and you have a guy, what we call a pickle uniform, which is the Forest Service Green uniform. Suit. Yeah, that guy knows about Crater Lake. Pickle He's going to tell you about Crater Lake, and the kids are going to be awed, and the, and everybody's a learning experience, and it's a positive thing. Yeah. And I'd like to think that preserve it for everybody. Now, that that's what, and so I think that what you're doing is that you're going to share that word in a positive way, and 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 the best thing we can do in life, in my opinion, is positively influence a person, in in a way that that it also positively influences the world, because there's so much negativity. But real, really, folks, it, it's a wonderful world, and we need to realize that. And you know, you can by limiting your you know, your time on TV and internet and movies and all that stuff creates a, a, a your mindset that is can be negative or <laughs> or biased. So I'm just going to go yeah, into yeah. it there. But. For people that are watching this on the video and they see this in the background, I guess, how would you describe your work as, do you want them to come out and experience this? Or I guess what would be a an ideal outcome for someone that's just seeing this for the first time and even just hiking to the top of any mountain. And if you want to see a fire lookout, you should go and see a fire lookout. And a lot of people, well, how do I do that? Well, there's so many different ways, you know. We're paper map people. So we went to Australia. We go to Australia. We're camped out. We go by the best paper map we can, and we sit there all night with our headlamps, and we go, that looks interesting. That looks interesting. Well, and that's for all the themes. Yeah, so that's how we find things. stuff. Sure, yeah. you could go on the internet, but it doesn't matter. You guys how are you so do friendly it. too. I mean, like I, I imagine that people that were working in these towers were kind of like hermetic and reclusive. So, yeah, well, we we've actually encountered uh, other lookouts Such that we came to visit, and they were like hands on hips. What do you want? You yeah. know, like so most to see people, what you're doing. You most know, people that you, do this are to be nice to people are introverts. So. They can come back negatively at you if you are nice to be. Most people Karma. get a quick yeah. job as they want to go up on the mountain and they want to be all alone with their dog or um, and they're writing their novel or they're doing whatever and that being is, an artist or a musician. And you can say that's a stereotype, right? <laughs> well, I'm an artist. He's a musician, but, but it is a stereotype, right? 
somewhat people think that they have a romantic notion of you being all by yourself but and our jobs have not been there that. are times when you just it's a barrage you know I, i'll say well somebody else is coming i got some more hikers oh well there's a guy on a motorcycle up oh, looks like the hand crew's coming up the hotshot crew's coming up today like there are days when i've got 10 people came to visit where me. i work so, we get a thousand to seventeen hundred people lava butte is the other it's the it is way the, visited it is look out way in visited the, in the whole northwest and possibly in america it might be one of the busiest. It's got a paved road it's the only lookout in oregon that has a paved road it is not like the road you just had to yes. try and by the way folks he drove a prius up here which and, is pretty impressive and, and i stopped to, to film it but he, he had to look underneath to see if there was stuff missing when he uh, got you here know, yeah. rocks dead bodies but i get a chance I ran to over talk on the to way a up. lot of people um in fact thousands uh, over my career at lava butte and um joey's so shy he yeah. doesn't want to talk to anybody and uh there, you're so reclusive <laughs> we mentioned the financial side of things how i feel like you know i feel like gosh i'm i don't have retirement and stuff but one thing that is, has hit me hard is that I've had people come back to Lava Butte years later, and they brought their family, and they said, "You remember us? I'm George and who and uh, you know and Rachel." And I'd be like, "I don't remember you." And they're like, "Well, you gave us a tour, and we thought it was so special. We brought our whole family up here to meet you." And I, and for me personally, it hit me in the heart like a gut punch. Like I actually influenced somebody without even trying, and they came back years later to meet me to bring their family and so that was like mm. better than any yeah. money can buy you know it was like it was like well what oh about the, what about the uh the podcast you were just showing me this morning the people that you're still following that are travelers absolutely yeah i was okay I'll he met the guy place. because he was wearing i a, was wearing a new york new york uh police department, police department. Shirt, and i had bought it she had got it for me at a garage sale and the guy came up and he goes, hey, you're from New York. You work for the police department. You know, and I'm like, he turns out the guy did. You know, the guy yeah. he has, he has spent his career working for the New York police department. But I had a New York police shirt. I said, no, I'm sorry. I didn't. But I, I think it's a cool shirt. And so I've been part of their lives for 10 years or probably seven to 10 years from someone I just met at the lookout tower because I was wearing the New York of you know, police department. It's the How random cool things, yeah. How cool is that? And maybe someday I'll go to New York and stay at their house, you know, like, you know, and so that's what, you know, I think life is so much fun. It's those connections. And like, you know, people get so depressed and and, 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 and and everybody does. There's nobody gets out of it. People have pain and misery and suffering and death, but you got to look at all these things like this and go wow you have like how the good fabulous stuff. like stop you know? counting the bad stuff and when we've been to australia when we went there we stayed with people we met that were bicycling around you know we just met random we players. met a guy in washington that was from australia traveling around the world on his bicycle two years later he was home and we went to see him in Melbourne and stayed with him. And so you know, like, it's about still connections, friends. right? You you you've made this connection. So hi, Tom Lester, if you get this yeah. podcast, <laughs> and, uh, hopefully you know influenced. Here for now, you and I will be a friend, right? You'll be calling. You see the smoke on the water at line. North North Twin. Oh yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah, if you need to. Know. Let me have a peek at it. I mean. That's not really where they're supposed to have fires, but people do. So we, what you can't see here, folks, is that we have um, a plethora of lakes around us, and it's um, it's absolutely stunning. And um, there's no way we could do justice with a camera. I mean, this is like you have to experience. It's kind of it. like taking a picture of the Grand Canyon. Yeah, you can. Yeah, can. You can. You're. It's. It's not big enough. <laughs> I love what you're saying about this connectedness because i i was gonna ask if you know do you have a community here with people that work in in the forest or the fire department or other f watchtowers is there like a a tribe of togetherness well, or is the, it the fire crew people are are kind of like our fire family you know they're like our summer group and Sadly, that's it's less than it used to be when we first got into this we hung out with all of them but it's a camaraderie. Part of it has to do yep. with um, the pandemic. That 
And those guys are way younger than us now, you know? We're like we're like that nutty aunt and uncle now instead of, you know, their age. But we do yeah. work with other lookouts. And like I mentioned, we have seven lookouts on the Deschutes. Basically, each tower, if you were to put it on the map, has a, a compass rose with a string. So if they see a fire, they shoot an azimuth, so a compass bearing, and then we shoot a, a bearing. And wherever that lines up, that's if we can see the base of the fire, that's where the fire is. So we end up talking and... Um, working with these other people and sometimes they become very good friends and sometimes they don't sometimes they're just a work acquaintance but um but yeah. like we have uh from our old forest we were on the mount hood we have a friend ann that we're still friends with and she used to be our neighbor lookout oh wow yeah and, uh, that's special yeah and the people that do this job of course it's not like any other job and, they're different kind of people yeah we yeah. tend to be the that. only extroverts group um, we're the chatty ones the rest of them hide apparently yeah. <laughs> very few that will be extroverts and in fact most of them would have turned you down for this um you completely know. we oh, had the new sure, york right. times wanted to interview us and i turned them down and i would rather have you do the interview just <laughs> well, so you, know. you, you, you that's very <laughs> you, meaningful you evidently Thank you, man. made an impression on it <laughs> I, appre I appreciate that the point is to get the word out that these places exist there's still humans doing the job and regardless of what you may heard about AI or uh, cameras, drones, and satellite images, we're still way faster. Um, one and of the things that we like to... Quite a bit more informative as well. Yeah, more informative. Yeah, I don't know if a camera could do a podcast about the importance of forestry and yeah. fire watch. And... Yeah. <laughs> one of our goals as um, as lookouts is we like to beat 911. So we, we have a... If you could be faster than the guy that's standing there with the phone, and <laughs> we've really had good. many times, we many times. So that's our goal: beat nine one one. And um, when the aircraft come over, we have aircraft that do fly at recon missions, mm -hmm. and um, we oftentimes it's like get the game. fire. We try to get it, and they try to get the fire before we do. And it's like this: it's 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 a it's kind of a game, but it's a race. Um, a bit, yeah. Because you know they're always going to have aircraft spotting fires but they're not always going to have us so we have to like be like okay we're going to beat that plane you know we see it like if they and uh we they have to say over the radio where they are all the time so we kind of know if they're like oh we're heading past elk lake all right i better really scan and make sure i've got and, and often time like these fires that they can see we can't see he gets here what's uh like what's the advantage of a fire tower versus uh an airplane so um when we don't move Yep. We can stay there all night and watch it. They so got to go back and when do the stuff. When storms come, they can't fly through um, thunderstorm. It's too violent. Too much right? wind and thunder. They have to go back to the well, station. We should sit right through the thunderstorm. So um, almost exclusively when there's thunderstorms, the aircraft have to leave. But we're here. So we get to see. Not only is it so primal, when you see lightning strike a tree and burst into flame, and then that flame drops onto the ground, and the wind hits it, and it goes up into the crowd. Pretty aggressive. And the, <laughs> the tops of the trees are just moving you're just 30 like, miles an hour, and you see flame. We kind of have that moment of, it is, somebody it, should call that fire in. Wait a minute, that's me. It is <laughs> absolutely <laughs> um, a thing that, you know, is, is incredible, and the planes a lot of times won't see that because they're going back to the airport. So you work together. Yeah, a yeah, a lot of time, or if... There's something that uh, we we have them go look at our blind spots. Oh, uh, like okay. All that area behind Lookout Mountain, yep. I can't see it. Do you have any way to meet the people in the air and the people on the ground? Is there any kind of, you know, gathering that people have there once in a while? No, but we can talk on our special channel called Air and the Ground. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, nobody else hears but us. You ever ask no. them how their day's going, or is it mostly? Yeah, it's very business. Business as usual. Or at least okay. I am. <laughs> yeah, she's business. I'm not. Well, we have um. There, there's a fence. Yeah, so we have beer. For lunch. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> there, there are events um that are exclusively for wildland firefighters, and um, we play in a band together, and so we our band actually played um a lot of these um wild the the wildland firefighter foundation. Yeah. We played these events, and a lot of times there would be pilots there. We would get to, get to meet some mm. of those folks. You know, we get mm, to meet nice. um, those folks. Um, and they, the the wild wildland firefighter foundation, um, 
they're nationwide and it's a pretty big organization. Um, uh, and I encourage anybody that would want to look it up to, to go to the website. But basically what they do is if there's a fallen firefighter on the job that may have had an injury or death, um, they provide support for the families. Financial support. Uh, financial support and other other things too for things that aren't covered and so you met by their employer yep and we call it a fire family so we're a fire family and um you're part of that too yeah we're part of it absolutely absolutely and i myself and people have helped us um the wildland fire foundation couldn't help me personally because i didn't have my injury on the job on the job but i was ran over at the gate here i was ran over by two zone i'm sure and i nearly died and um people came that I didn't, people I don't even know came and donated money. Um, I was in the hospital and, um, it, it, you know, it, it's the fire family and they people more made work. us dinners. They brought us food. They did all kinds of amazing things for us. And, Not and just financial, but, you know, a, a, a virtual, a virtual hug, so to speak, uh, always asking how people cut us fire came to see him I mean, in the hospital. So we pay it forward when we can. And so, you know, that, that that's what, and that's what honestly, family should that's be. That's what wildland firefighters, it is a tight knit. You, when you work in a, a job like that, you, you're like, um, the, you are in the hands of the people you work with that day in the woods. If you get hurt, they will provide care for you. They may carry you physically out of the forest. You get stung by a bee. One of them's going to give you the epi. You it you become very close like that because you're you share it all. You know mm-hmm. you get to know them really well. <laughs> I believe there's not a lot of secrets. And you depend on them quite a bit for just the day. You know, you spend a lot of time. So a lot of trust between. Very much, you know, share your lunch even sometimes. You know, it, so they break it down into a modules. different kind of job. For sure. So modules. So each one of the engines is a module of people. So say six people and they rotate seven day coverage or you'll have a hand crew, which is our hand crews. We have uh, east and west of 97 and we have 10 person hand crews and they'll rotate the seven day coverage or you'll have hotshot crews, which are 20 people. And so these modules of people, they develop these relationships, not only they as friends, but as professionals. Together. And so that that's where they 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 um they know each other's strengths and weaknesses, and you know it's pretty amazing because like you would think that a woman that was 110 pounds could not possibly be as strong as a male that's 210 pounds, right? But these women are incredible; they're just incredible. Um, and I could go on and on about it, but I just want to say that the women that do the job are just every much as strong. Like most 14%. 14%. That's very the small. Of the, of very small. Yeah. Wildland fire. Yeah. 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 What do you, what do you think? I mean, if you had to think about what would be maybe one of the reasons it is such a small percentage. Mm, they become moms. Changes their world. Sure. Um, some don't like to get dirty. Some it's a uh, cord. You have a physical fire guys um, don't hold back. Let's just say the way they speak and the way they are, and some women well, find that offensive. Has has that been uncomfortable for you to be around ever? Or? They have apologized for their language sometimes, but I say you're good. You know, be yourself. Uh, I've I've always on on fire situations when I've gone working with them, I always felt like they treated me like their sister. Kind of, you know, they cared for us. You know, we we were they're nice to us. Yeah, but it's gotten better. It has. It's improved. It's way worse because there's more more women, and they've been reminded. You know, like you you get girls here. You know, we want to tone it back, fella. You know, like, but for the most part, um, just the people themselves have have um, uh, changed over the years. The the people who are firefighters maybe are different than the typical logger type from the 50s, say. It's an organ, organ As an territory. example. Yeah, yeah. And we have, we have more that. diversity than we yeah. have, and that is um is one thing in our field. But it's not that they feel like they have to be better. They probably want to be. The Forest Service has changed over the 
course of five or ten years to be more. A lot of them are pretty darn respectful of yeah, girls even out there trying to do it. You know, well, like they'll say, "My wife would never be thing. out here." You know, <laughs> it's been a really good thing. It's went yeah. from what you would consider like a redneck logger to now we're all we're we're not that way anymore. You know, and it's cool, and I've I've really enjoyed it because my early career, it wasn't so much the redneck logger than than the uh, hardcore like firemen were just harsh like not necessarily with language but like it's such a hard job that it's like military okay mm -hmm. like you have to be on your game you physically, know physically yeah and even now up these hot it. shots you wouldn't believe the fitness level most of these people are athletes so they run you know on their off time they're running marathons and they're 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 always keeping up and and so for us personally to be over 50 you know shannon's goal was to be she wanted to be red hearted until she was over 50. Yeah. She wanted to be a woman that was still fighting fires over 50. And you have to keep yourself in shape. It, yeah. It's, that, it's and intense. I, I liked that aspect. I liked that it required me to be healthy and in shape. I wanted to have a reason to do that. And, and I'm pretty darn proud when I did it at 50 years old, still the pack test and worked on a fire crew. <laughs> And, but and even we now, both we're not red carded. We are in the best shape. It, um, we're in good shape. We could still do it. You know, we we could still do it, but we choose to be in the lookout and um, it, it, save our hiking but, for the. But yeah, that's the, thing. the, uh, the backpacking season. We fit to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. You kind of mentioned how, I guess, not reclusive but hermetic this could be for some people. How do you manage your your happiness and your sense of connectedness with? this job that involves you to be away for so long for nine seasons we were in Sisai butte which is on the uh, mount hood on the southern end of mount hood near mount jefferson wilderness and we were remote like it was four hours to town and um but even at that we would we would party with the with the fire crew so like we we always um commuted yep. you know even after our him to have a picture of it right here. yeah hold it up yeah. So we've always, even though we were remote, we were always um, social. Um, Hanging out with the fire crew, we would go down after hours, and some we've of those gone people that extra mile, don't you think? Have we've always are still our friends. We still hang out with some of those people yeah, that we yeah. met way back then. So you can be a hermit and still um, not be, you know, if you want to. Um, in the early years, in our off season, we were working at ski resorts. We actually worked at Mount Bachelor, and the kind of people that worked there also were travelers or outdoorsy type. We call so we met water. a lot of people that are still our friends. The way we became fire lookouts was in a blizzard in 1996, and that was the. Uh, but we had we yeah we had gone to rent one for the weekend. And we heard the weather report. Oh, it's going to snow three and a half three feet. feet. Like, How awesome is that going to be? Well, there could be a downside. So we had gone um, up to this lookout tower and we had a great weekend and it snowed three and a half feet and we had to go back to our jobs. Being snow. as dedicated as we are, we felt like and I had to go back to work. I had, you know? I had gone to the library oh. and I got this book and it was called how to Take Six Months Off. That was the name of the book. We're going to have to look that one up Before now. Before Tim Ferriss's uh, <laughs> four-hour work week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I read that, and I'm like, there's people that only work six months of the year. They work six months, they save their money, and they travel or do whatever the other six months. And I thought, that's brilliant. Like, why would you work longer than you have to, right? Like, I, and like, so is this what, possible? We got caught in this. We, we, we had to be back at our jobs on Monday. So Sunday... Sunday. Morning, we start we skiing out, going, and it was way too very, and very and slow going. We our snowmobile nine, got seven stuck nine, seven nine, miles from our car. Snowmobile got stuck, so we abandoned it and continued. He was on uh, cross country skis. I was with snowshoes, but every step we were up to our knees in fresh snow, which that was getting dark pretty slowly. At, at that pace you 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 it's a lot of work and, and the water bottle froze so, so we're not drinking drink. any water and we had no food left and then it was probably 50 to 70 mile an hour gusts so it was it was it, you know snow in your face and 
Um, it was getting dark. Slow we going. We weren't going to make the car. But he had also got this book, and he had been... How to Stay Found. And staying Found by June Fleming. June Fleming, And yes. he was all about going and doing this snow cave thing. Honey, we should really go do a snow cave. And so learned how to make a snow trench, which is As we're cave. digging the snow cave that we're going to spend the night in, he says, I'm serious. This is... This is not the way I wanted to do this. I thought it would just be fun, not like for survival. And anyways, we back then you, there wasn't a thermarest was not invented. We do not have a cell. It was 1996, and maybe there was something like that, but we just had a tarp. So anyway, she laid on the tarp, and she started to go hypothermic just because it was taking my heat. It was, she was sucking her heat away. It and, was enough to scare us into changing our lives. And I had I had this book and I had a matchbook. And the matchbook was <laughs> and the matchbook was wet and the lighter was non existent. And I felt like I had to get a fire going or we weren't gonna survive the night. And I literally and I tried match after match after match and I was down to the last and I'd taken my sleeping bag and I'd put it down on the snow so I got have a dry branches, surface and I tried to get all the branches that had snow on them and I tried to make the you know I was going to make a fire and I literally was down to the last match tore the book up I tore the book up how to take six months off and I and I lit the last match and it you know it went and then I was like and it barely lit and the wind's blowing on it and I'm like holy crap it, holy shit it like, was and I get the, those moments where you're thinking this really isn't happening like this is serious. Like, we have to sleep here tonight. This is scary. She did not want to admit it when I said, we have to, we have to make it okay. And she was no. like, no, I don't want We it. have to keep we going. Go he says, anyway, I don't have any energy to keep going. But at no point were we lost. We knew where yeah. we were. We knew where our car was. We, 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 we were just the, trying to get back to the car. I got some frostbite, but I got the, I got the match lit, and I got the book lit, and I got the fire going and that helped and that pretty much saved us and the next day there was a search party for us but we had already we'd already hiked most of the way we we so we could hear them we could hear their snowmobiles and we could hear that they were having a hard time going you know that oh she was such a dedicated employee where she worked at the print shop that the people knew that if she didn't show up on monday the supervisor called my parents and said I don't know how to tell you this, but your daughter didn't show up for work this morning and she didn't call either. We know that this is serious, you know. She she would never do that. That's and not so her we personality. Were laying in the snow cave and when I got the money, yeah. I got my 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 mom, you know, if I even brought it up to her now, she'd probably burst crying like, "Yeah, I remember the phone call. I was really upset. I didn't know where you were and what had happened, but I had written a letter to my grandmother." and told her this weekend we're going on a trip so they raced up to my grandma's house and asked you know where did shannon wrote you a letter what did she say in it and it said where we were going so my parents called the ranger station his parents called the ranger station and they kept saying this is where our kids are can somebody go look for them and we did so we got the fire going and we were obviously okay after that and we decided her and I, we were newlyweds. We had just been married. Two years. And I, we, and we had been in this printing industry. And I said, you know what? If we survive this, let's quit our jobs and go do and the do fire something lookout. Else. And we were ready to, well, actually, we wanted to be lighthouse keepers. That was it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we did all the research. But anyway, we said, if we survive this, we're going to quit our job. And it wasn't two weeks later after that, we quit our careers. We both had apprenticeships. We were journeymen. Okay, so we were, you know, we I was a supervisor of what well, of a union print shop and she became a supervisor and we gave it all up to make nothing our first two years. Because we out. wanted uh experiences. We wanted to do something different that would be an adventure, be fun, be something. And and nutty as it is, we were at a fire lookout when we made this decision in our lives. And, like, and then it'll you know, be a fire lookout. And so then we went would... to do it for the summer and you know, the owner of the print shop was kind of like, you know, if this is about money, Shannon, I'll pay you more money. I said, you don't understand. I want to go do something different. You know, it isn't you paying me more money. I don't want to be in this building with no windows anymore. I got to get out of here, you know, like caged person. Was there a buildup to that point or was it just sort of a, like a 
I don't know, a monotone sort of average feeling every day. There was a buildup because every yeah. weekend we were going out in the woods. We were going somewhere and and and, we were and doing stuff you in the get woods. Get to a point we where wanted you wanted to be in the woods. You feel like yeah, this is where we should be, not there. Huh. And how can we work out there? I guess is kind of kind of the thought behind it. But I thought it was kind of funny that his wife was pretty wealthy lady, and she was jealous of me. And I thought, huh? She says. I would love. She could go anywhere in the world. To be houses all. Over I would the world. love to be in the out in the woods for the summer, just painting and reading books. And I'm thinking, this woman could have anything, and she's jealous of me. And I'm thinking, <laughs> so do it. You know, what's your deal? <laughs> it's attainable. You know, there's there's more than one space and, and like this. And what would say to your viewers right now, if there, if there's someone out there that wants to be a fire lookout, if you watch this and you're like oh my God, that looks like exactly what I want to do, then there's nothing stopping you from doing it. Check it out. Um, Find out about it. And, you know, do your homework and figure out what the district, you know, a lot of people want to do this job and they ask me like, well, how do you get a job like this? Well, it's pretty simple, but there's one thing that I would, the advice that I would give them is find out where you want to be. So if you're from Washington State and you want to be in Washington State, then go to Washington State and figure out if they still have humans doing this. And, you know, work the system backwards. Find out where you want to be and then try to... Yeah, go visit it. some of them. You know, what's so there? People, what's available? People, they look at uh, these jobs as uh, we, we call them their grade scale. It's GS level government. And they want, they want to make the most amount of money they can. So they're like, I want to be a GS5 lookout and the Deschutes is the only place that pays GS5 wages, you know. Well, the thing about working here is it's a lot of urban interface. It's not for beginners. Fast-paced. It's, intense. You're not going to be up there writing your novel. You're you're going to have human contact that may not be always a positive experience. There are days that I don't pick up my paintbrush. I didn't but, have time. <laughs> but anything in life, I always tell people, yeah. like, if you want to, you know, with the Forest Service or um, any kind of, job at all like you you know if you want to do something interesting then you know research it and find out and go and do it because there's nothing stopping you man nothing you just and w there's always going to be a kickback or what do you, what's the word for it um there's always going to be somebody telling you you know yep yep you roadblocks that, or you need a degree or whatever. somebody trying to tell you otherwise, otherwise you've got to be persistent and just um and none of it's forever go try it for one summer what the heck? Not just people that we talk to that come visit that some of them have been a lookout back in the 1950s. 50s. When they tell their story about them being a lookout back in the 50s, I did it for one summer, they'll say, and they have a sparkle in their eye like it is the most. And not only do they have a sparkle had. in their eye, but they tell you that on a certain day in July, they remember sitting having a peanut butter sandwich on that day, looking out the window with a squirrel on their lap, and they remember that that was the time of their life. They, you know, it was the most fun. They may even be partly have dementia, but they remember this one day of their life in in a lookout tower. And we say, well, why did you not go back? Yeah, and do the, it? yeah. Like, they're like, but the same the reason they pe got people don't drive Volkswagen buses. I needed something more reliable. Yeah. <laughs> Make more money. I needed to make more money. I got married. My wife wasn't interested in going out there with me. Uh, or what? There's you no know, problem. we had kids. We moved to the city. You know, there's always these things. But the fact that we've we've talked to many people who have done this a long time ago, they all have that same sparkle, sparkle and they that, and can remember that a certain remembrance that certain you could thing, a certain see. fire they spotted or a certain thing that they remember. Yes. There's all these weird existential questions to ask, but it, it, most people are afraid to go over that that hurdle. You know, like mm -hmm. they know they don't like where they're at. They're they're yeah. bored. They're, there's something that's not meaningful, but the money is there, and then there's stability. And yes, and and as far as like huh? being Why able to to make it, you know, like I was frightened when we quit our jobs and walked away. Yeah, I had no, I had, had semi panic attacks saying, I said, are we making the right choice? And somehow in life, I mean, I have always things have always worked out okay. And you just have to believe that it's gonna be okay.
you learn to live with less. And in a way, it's almost like taking heavy stuff out of your backpack. You end up happier without all those things. If your backpack's too heavy, you can't get where you want to go. Yeah. Did you start to notice that when you got in this lifestyle that things were getting better from the internal world? Yes. Physically. Physically, for sure. Yeah. I felt... We were my body was it. going downhill. We I did it. not exercise. We working, um, I was out. pale we from being inside all the time. In the I didn't eat well. I drank a lot of coffee. I lived on potato chips and <laughs> oh, famous Amos cookies <laughs> from the vending machine. And yeah, I'm making salads up here. I'm we're running the steps. I'm in the I'm in the so picking mushrooms and eating you know we're eating uh, natural foods and um, plant based stuff and, and yeah, we're... some of the experiences that I've had here, interactions with wild things have been the neatest things that have ever happened to me in my whole life. I walked out on this deck one day with a flowered shirt and a hummingbird came and hovered and looked at my shirt and looked at me and looked at my shirt and looked at me and then went. <clears throat> and I was like. Whoa, you can't buy that. It just happened to me. <laughs> For what, three weeks, we had a bear. He was a little scrappy guy, and he'd come up and he'd drink out of the water tub that we got down here. Every day, he'd come and he'd drink about two gallons of water. He just. I have a picture of him up there, and, too. You could take and, a picture uh, later. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it was so cool because. Um, what does a bear do all day? He just hangs out and he eats roots, he um, sits, you know, just looks at stuff. <laughs> He never came up on our deck. He never bothered us. There was a teacher when in my early, I was like third or fourth grade, and she used to smack, she'd smack kids with a ruler. But of course, my name's Joey, so of course I got it all the time because it, you know, because you're, yeah, because I'm really overactive and stand on death. I remember once she <laughs> slapped me on the wrist, she slapped me with that ruler, and she said, Joey, stop staring out the window. You're never going to get a job doing that. And well, here I am is. <laughs> doing the jobs. What What are some? Because you know, I guess when you you pursue an unconventional path, um, and you go against these social norms, like you know, what are some misconceptions that maybe some people in your life or around you have had of of Ooh, you and your lifestyle? Good question. Some people think that we've got it made and that we don't have, have any problems or um, we don't struggle with the same things that other people. A lot of people are envious or they're jealous of the fact that we only work six months of the year. But guess what? Um, I bust my ass. In the time that we do work, it's Uh, almost a year. We've got other things. If you add up the hours. Uh, We work (laughs) at ski resorts and, uh, you know, we, we, her and I, we work our asses off um even those six months many ago. many hours so you know we... I, I have i usually say that the forest service owns us in the summer we have had different things you know setbacks i i had a sore throat one day and i couldn't talk on the radio so he came it was his day off and he spoke for me <laughs> you know because you can't talk you can't call fires in a lot of people will say oh well it must be nice to have the winter off or it must be nice that you don't have to work or you you know, well, it must be nice that you have a 401k. We, must we, be nice we put you have, in our time. must be nice that you have health insurance. I don't have a dental yeah. plan. You know, yeah. I've had to pay thirty or $40,000 for my teeth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, you know, out of pocket expense where other people have had there's, that. There's so that ups those, and downs to those, it. For the sure. comments really rub us the wrong way. Or maybe personally, I can speak for myself. They rub me the easy, wrong way. Easy because, blood pressure. Because, I've, uh, uh, you know, life is about choices, and we've made an unconventional choice, but we work just as hard or more hard, harder than other people. We, we're dedicated and, to uh, it, and for sure. We make pennies for what we do, so we have to be very frugal, and everything that we, we've earned or own or our cars and a house that we live in has been only through... Um, sacrificing things that other people take for granted. You know, we don't have a garbage service. We don't smoke cigarettes. We, we don't, don't go out to dinner we don't, all the time. We haven't watched TV for no, 28 no cable. years. We don't have cable. We don't have internet service. You know, all these things. We've hauled our own water. We've gotten water out of a spring. You know, like people can't imagine drinking out of a spring or hauling your water. So for, for someone to give us grief about our, um, or like we've, 
spent quite a bit of time in Hawaii or we went to Belize or we were uh, we spent six months in Australia as we went to be fire lookouts there. So we've worked on the fire crews in Australia. <laughs> we've busted our ass to get where we have and we've made the choices that other people were maybe too afraid to make in life. And so it really does kind we, of rub me. It was like taking a risk almost. When people say, oh, it must be nice. And, uh, you know, I, I understand. It is, but you don't know the whole story. Yeah. Did people try to rationalize their decision not to go down that path, right? Yes, by, yeah. By and projecting I'm, that on to, uh -huh. to you. Uh -huh. And there's a difference between envy and jealousy, right? I mean, and it, it's a big difference, you know, because I'm envious of a lot of people. My buddy... I was working the other day and I was not having a good day. And I he sent me a picture of a fish that he had just caught on the river. And I was I was envious that I wasn't there, right? But I wasn't jealous of him. But. I can totally relate to that because it's you know those judgments hurt, you know, because you did give up a lot. And then it's at the end of the day, it's probably more of them just saying, "I'm jealous of of you." I feel a lot of times people we as humans um, misinterpret. We never know what another person's perspective is. Um, especially from text messages, you get a text and you think, oh my God, that, you know, and you're mad, but that person may have not even meant what he said or they said. And so we perceive, um, what another person's thinking. And then we get to know somebody and then we, then we really think we know what they're, cause, oh, that's my sister. I know that she's, thinking they, they like, weren't mad cause it was all not, caps. They accidentally be, pushed that all caps. So off base, you know, and so, um, I, I like to keep an open mind and think, okay, maybe I'm wrong, you know? How do you deal with these kind of misconceptions that, you know, obviously they hurt when people... We try to line them out. <laughs> you know, we, lately, I've been lining them out. And our job here is 8 to 8, so 8 in the morning to 8, eight at night. And then if I commute anywhere, it's an hour and a half one way and an hour and a half the other way. I work at Lava Butte, so I have to get up at 5.30 a.m. and I We see more there. sunrises than most people. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's one there, the benefits. It wakes us in the morning. So yeah, the, you, you, you're right. There is a lot that people don't under, know or understand, and that's okay. But you were asking before, what are other reasons people couldn't or wouldn't do this job? And one of those is you're giving up your whole summer, you know? Yeah. Finding somebody to fill in for us. You want to go to your favorite pretty band? Tricky. You want to go to the Foo Fighters? I know I want to go see the Foo Fighters, yeah. but I'm not going to be able to do it because You give up I'm a lot. Here. Yeah, you do. You don't get to do all these things and... um. And then, unfortunately, sometimes we want to attend that, stuff. That, that is like the Forest Service has not trained other people to take our place. So we wish there was a training so we program. Take some days off when we see a fire because we have skin in the game because we've been here, we've worked on the fire crews. We have the experience that even the most intelligent, book smart it takes person years to acquire all. Come that. up here and be what we are, but the the Forest Service has neglected to train people to to, to be at that like level. they they have fire school every year to train new people firefighters firefighters but we wish that there was like a lookout school and we had like one new person every year that's going to be and we like to think that the, uh, an extra helper if we want time off and we're in a dying trade and just like i was an engraver the only engravers nowadays are the people printing money you know that's engraved money is engraved and um most engraving besides money is not happening most fire lookouts are being um, abandoned, um, and they're being abandoned at a rapid rate. Um, they're being abandoned by the Forest Service, the BLM, the Park Service, and um, they're finding that the only value that they see to these places is if they have fire detection, and then the fire detection is only valuable if there's a resource at risk, and what does that mean? That means that there's urban interface, so that means towns and communities and campgrounds and buildings. That makes us more valuable because we can also be faster than the AI that's there. We can be better at it. But what that's about one thing we have previous knowledge? But what about those huh? structures that are built huh? that are in Montana that don't look over urban interface? Are they not as valuable as we are? We say they are. And not only for fire detection, but again, Back to that heritage thing, our cultural heritage as Americans. The CCC days, you know, we built so many bridges and roads and buildings. They built lodges. Timberline Launch, which and is beautiful. You know, we did in so Oregon. much in the in the you know that 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 we're not doing nowadays. And I think people need we're we're you know those generations. Most of those people are gone, and um, 
those of us that still remain, that still look at the history of, of these things and think that it's such a value, not as a fire detection tool necessarily, but that too, but as a heritage of they're, they're interesting to see and their kids to see. And maybe a couple hundred years from now, these buildings are still in the top of mountains and, pe and families are able to go there, maybe spend the night and see what it was like to be a forest ranger and to and to experience that. That's what I want personally. If you feel connected around here to the, to that sense of heritage, like what, I guess how would you describe that? In this area, we had what they called the sheep wars. And so basically um, the early forest service was sent out here and we had sheep herders in this area and they had huge flocks of sheep, like 50,000 you know, like meg mega flocks, but they were keeping the forest trimmed back. Yeah, and that's eating. one thing when you think about um, fire ecology and stuff. When we talk about you know coming into thinning forests and stuff, well, sheep are the answer. You know, they trim all your ladder fuels, fuels, and they put their poop in the ground and they enhance the earth. But they've Instead, got small feet, so they're not tearing stuff. Yeah, up. And, and so the answer in their carbon sink, you know, it's it's really the way of the future, I think, is going to be sheep in the forest. But in the history of the Forest Service, these early forest foresters had to come out here. There were no roads, and they had to tell these sheep herders, they had to say, guess what, buddy? You've been grazing your sheep for 10 years. Now you're going to pay taxes on it. And these sheep herders wanted to kill these foresters. So one of the early foresters was a guy named Cy Bingham, and, and he um, there's trees around here that are still carved with his name from 1905. You can go and find these trees with his initials in there. Well, he was hunted down by these sheep herders because they he had to tell them, you're going to have to start paying taxes with the U.S. government, and they didn't like it, you know. It was a lot of resistance. A lot of resistance, and, uh, yeah. you know, now when you think about sheep, I think it's the answer to our climate change, and to it's not, it's one of the answers to how we can mitigate these mega fires. I mean, yeah, you talk about eco-friendly activity. So you go it seems pretty eco-friendly to me. You're, 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 you're impacting the land with these machines, right? You're going in, and you're you're close, you're clearing, you're taking trees down and stuff, which is, you have to do some of that. But like, imagine 50,000 sheep, they can clear an area. They're not like goats. Now goats are a little more. Um, goats might actually eat some of the tree bark. The other <laughs> stuff that you don't want to, but sheep goats will eat the, what we call appetite. ladder fuel. So, so you have the duff layer and that is pine needles. And so if you get a fire in the duff, it's just small flames, you know, six inch flames. But once we have ladder fuels, and those are bushes that are like, say, one foot to 10 feet tall, like manzanita and ceanosis and these brush. And then when the fire gets into the duff layer, then it can get into the ladder fuels, and the ladder fuels allow it to get into the crowns of the trees. So when you have a crown fire, if there's any wind involved, the wind if it's 10 mile an hour wind, that means that fire can move at 10 miles an hour across the crowns of the trees, the tops of the trees. But if you had a 50 mile an hour wind, which is common in a thunderstorm, you can a fire can move. And you know from being in California that it can be roof to roof to roof to roof. Yep. You look at Santa Rosa, Can't oh, the run whole it. town's gone. You it know? goes quick. And so all of that, when you look at Paradise and some of the major fires in California in the last decade, well, we had it happen here, too, is Detroit. We've had some major, yeah, 2020, we lost communities all over Oregon. But guess what, folks? That's just the tip of the iceberg to what could happen in the future. Now, do you want to get rid of a human that up here making pennies <laughs> because you're going to put AI somewhere? Or would you rather have someone up here looking out for your interest? You know, this is where we're at. Like, we're at an inflection point, like... Um, everybody's enamored we're enamored by technology and what it can do and um and guess what you know all that stuff is just like the wide leg pants you remember the 70s it's a bad when you had <laughs> pants that were wide leg well guess what it all comes back and it's all yeah. come back to humans and they're going to say why did we get rid of all these humans not just doing what we do but other careers too and i say you know let's let's use the technology but realize still an advantage there still can do way more even though the computer's way smarter than us it can't it can't do what we do it doesn't have the same emotions or the same uh 
thought process. That's a, yeah. Yeah. Logic. They don't have ethics. There's no empathy, right? No, no concern. <laughs> Humans will oftentimes make nonsensical decisions, and sometimes those are the right decisions, right? It's not mm-hmm. always the thing it, that makes sense. It is mm-hmm. intuition. Like you, mm-hmm. you just know something's right. You know, that's a. Well, even going back to fire history, um, Pulaski was the guy who Ed he Pulaski. he held people at gunpoint in a cave okay, if and said, if you stay in here, it's, it's he saved school. their lives. It's a fire. They wanted to run school. for it. So it's an axe on one side. It looks like an axe, and on the other side, it has it's a like curved, a pick? curved pick. Yeah, that's so that tool was invented by name Ed Pulaski and named after him. But in the 1911 or 1910 fires, yeah, which in the West was it devastated Montana, Wyoming, all uh, with all kind of the way. the biggie that changed a lot of this and made them want to have and people he on the top people of the into a cave at gunpoint and to, because and he that. knew that he if they just stayed there and let it go by they wouldn't get burned over he saved die. their lives and he saved their lives as like you were saying like something that maybe doesn't make sense makes sense later <laughs> how would you describe in your own words just living life to the fullest kind of the working on the bucket list thing you know and you kind of like recheck that all the time like add to it take away from it mark things off keep in in tune with you know stick with what makes you happy what what makes you um like when i paint time goes away i forget what time it is i'm like in this painting like you know everybody has their thing that they're just like totally absorbed in and and that's doing that and being here where it's a comfortable relaxing place that's living life to the fullest i think that's really well said. Yeah, I I don't I don't think you can live life to the fullest if you're angry. Yeah. I think that if you have anger in your heart that um it's going to be really hard to achieve that. And so I think that um we ha- as humans we have to um somehow find a way to let anger and resentment those things are going to with, with people hold that, you back. Somehow you got, and I know it's hard, people, but like, if you can somehow find a way to let it go, or um, and, and then I think you can. Do you feel like just being in a lifestyle where you're more connected to a, a different energy level or a different wavelength helps with that? It really doesn't matter um, if you're living in the inner city in Chicago and you never see a forest like we have, that you can still have a mindset of positivity and mm-hmm. love and peace in your heart. So I, I think that all these things are important, that you need to have some nature in your life and that you can have the experiences that we have. But I honestly believe that a lot of life is your mindset. So you can be on the battlefield and still have a mindset that can find beauty in, in, in anything. It, that's just my personal opinion. Did you always have that opinion? I fostered it, and and I, I don't want to be a hypocrite because um, I get, I have problems just like everybody else, and I have days that are terrible. Look at people in your life that you admire, not necessarily like celebrities because they may or may not be the greatest thing in the world, but people around your family and your friends, and you'll find that there's somebody that stands out, and look at that person and look at what they do and emulate that. Look to those people in your life that um, that 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 make you that you think, wow, I want to be more like that. I want to be more forgiving. And, you know, as I get as people get older, generally what happens is we get more jaded and we get more bitter. Yeah, and we things hurt the way they and, used to be. And, and, and I'm not saying that I'm any different. And as I get older, I'm pissed off all the time. But I can look to those people that that aren't pissed off, and I can and I can say. I want to be like that. And so even if you're not like that, you can try to be like that. And I say the biggest thing in life is as long as you're trying to be whatever it is you want to be, at least you tried, you know. So say you fail at something, I don't think it's a failure. I think that it was an attempt. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. and like, yeah. um, I'm always for the underdog and the person that's trying. So you might only have a second grade 
reading level, but by God, if you're and you're trying to do whatever it is you're doing, then I'm I'm all about it. I'm going to support you to the end. You know, so that that's my personal philosophy. Yeah, these are beautiful words, man. Be kind. Be kind, and um, you know, if you if there's something that or someone or a problem that you have, try to have an open mind and think about another person's perspective. <laughs> because what you think they're thinking is probably not what they're thinking. And Ringo Starr said it best. Life is about peace and love. Peace That's and all love. it's about. <laughs> all you politicians out there. Peace and love. You politicians, they talk about war and power and money and debt ceiling bullshit. Really, it's about loving up on the people that are around you. So that's my advice. Yeah. Your your community. We're in a band, uh, and our neighbor is our drummer. Mike is a very positive person, and, he, and he's also our neighbor and our friend. I play bass, and Joey plays the guitar and writes the songs, and we're called the Gross Tones, and because we live on Gross Drive. <laughs> the worst name or also possibly the best name in the it's memorable but uh it it it's a lot of fun uh we do mostly original songs that joey writes and um i am kind of new to the music thing i didn't always play but i've been playing since uh probably 13 years now but you know, I, I have sometimes when we'll perform, people will come and say, oh, gosh, I wish I could play an instrument. And I always say, I didn't used to. You know, this isn't something I picked up when I was seven. I Try it. You know, you just never know. You're never too old. You can train yourself to rock <laughs> lots of things. Yeah. You are never too old to rock and roll. <laughs> You're never too old to rock and roll. We're just doing it. And I'm not so worried about, like, putting the music out and, like, trying to get fans or even playing gigs. I just like drinking a beer and playing with my buddy and playing with my best friend, you know? And so one, one could say that you guys really live like true rock and roll. <laughs> you, oh, yeah, you know baby. what I mean? You make art for you and, and that's it. And, and you live a life that you're happy with. That's absolutely. We're doing like, we're doing okay. That's rock and yeah. roll right there. So, <laughs> and it's fun. And, 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 um, kind of a, um, almost like going to therapy in a way it, it I don't know really how else to describe it because whenever we have like kind of an intense week and we'll play and we'll, we'll all at the end say, gosh, we needed that, you know, because in a way you're in the music, you're not thinking about anything else. You're focusing on listening to these other two. You're listening to the words and you're thinking about your part coming up where you got to sing backups and your, your whole body is in it. I mean, like when I play the bass, I can literally feel it in my stomach and there's something about that when we play music with other people, not just play music, but when you have to play with other people, there is something that happens in our brain that is not duplicated by any other activity. It's like this connectiveness. And I, you know, being kind of new to it, he's played for a really long time, but being new to it, I, he told me at some point, because I used to just have to concentrate and really think about what I was doing and looking at my fingers the whole time. And he said, you wait one day, you will be playing your instrument and your brain will wander off and you will still be playing and you will be able to think about something else. And by golly, when that moment happened to me, it was bizarre. It was like, wait a minute, I was just thinking about that spot on the car over there. there right? And I just, you almost stopped because like, what just happened? Like, your hands kept going and your mind was over there. It was wow. until it, that happened. <laughs> what I tell musicians too is that, you know, it's like learning something when you're in school. So say you don't really play an instrument that much, but if you play an instrument for five minutes every day for 40 years, I guarantee you will improve. You will improve. And, you, you know, that that's the key for me. A lot of people wait for the muse as a musician. Like, I just don't feel like it. But I look at it as an assignment. So I love, like, I here's a song I want you to write, and you have five days to write. I love a deadline. Boom. And so it's an assignment. And then every time you do that assignment, um, anything in life, no matter what it is, if it's the consistency of doing it over and over for small amounts of time, even if, like, you want to be fit, you don't have to work out for two hours a day. You got to do 
specific exercises. Start for start with twenty minutes. You got to know what started. they. If you know what they are, <laughs> and if you do it every day religiously, you're going to probably be fit, or you're probably going to learn your instrument. Apparently, it takes three years to convince uh, your future wife to, uh, <laughs> to go marry. on a date. <laughs> yeah, to go on a date. Very picky. And it worked. Yeah. It worked. That's something I think about a lot. It's just like you know the. We're never perfect when we try something, you know, for the first time. We just yeah, you just or, have to or at, do at it any, at any point. You never. Elton John's not perfect, you know. There's just he has down days and then, too. You know, <laughs> and if you're worried about sharing something because you don't think it's as good as somebody else's, well then, it might be different than somebody else's. And you know? and then there's like techniques too. You know, like sometimes uh, I think people learning an instrument, even like from a teacher, they'll say, well, don't hold your hand like that, or don't do this, or don't do it that way. And maybe sometimes it's a, well, your wrist is going to eventually hurt if you don't do it yeah, a certain are. way. Yeah. But then sometimes it's a technique that, are, should you correct it? It's like the right hand, left hand thing. Should you correct it? I mean, you watch Bob Marley and he wraps that thumb around the top and plays the trap string. It's unique. He still well, did. Well, no, it's not that. Unique. But he he still did the the job. Got done. Yeah. He still played an instrument. Probably any instructor would have said, "Get that thumb down there." But it's his thing, you no, know. They actually that that is but a technique that's been. That was just an example, though, right. because there are like people who do something a certain way, and who says that's wrong? It's just different. You remember the Def Leppard drummer? Yeah. Yes. Had Lost to totally learn. Killed it. Still killed it. Yeah. You know? Had to and totally learn a different way. The whole point of it is, in my opinion, is that you, if you're having fun, you're still doing it. That if you're having fun and you're actually improving, then that's a bonus. But even if you're not improving, if you're having fun, so you know, we looked at our life and we said, how can we have the most fun in the next thirty years? And I suggest that people look at their life in the next year. The next five years, the next ten years, twenty years. How can I have the most Take fun? time for but have, but also have a balance of of what it is, and it's got to be legal too. Yeah, legal. Yeah. But yeah. but it's all about choice of friend. <laughs> yes, I mean, you made the choice to be here right now. And life's about choices, and it so, is totally about you choices. Know, think about how much fun you want to have. I've always been. I've never. I've had jobs my whole life since I was thirteen, and I always did jobs. That were fun, and when they weren't fun anymore, I never looked at. I got to make this amount of money. So many people say, "I got to make a hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to go to college and get a master's degree and whatever." Well, I looked at the world and said, "What's the most fun I can have doing a job? And who cares about how much money? If I, you know, if I have the most fun being a gas pump attendant, then be a gas pump attendant. If you can live on those wages, then do it. Like, who needs to, you know, like do what." is the funnest thing you can that you can make a balance in life and still make it work, you know? So, like, who... I've, it's not about making more money. It's about learning how to spend less. Mm. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Well, when we first started this bit, that Toyota 4Runner down there was the only thing we owned. So life was not very expensive. How would you describe your relationship with frugality, if you want to call it that, or resourcefulness or minimalism or we definitely were more frugal and in, in earlier times we have we are we have run into some resistance with other people thinking that gosh just spend the money my they, stepfather no, used to say joe you're we don't have bad. to spend you 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 have to think about the future you know we we make money in the summer and we can't just go spend it all the first week of winter because we got to make it all the way through <laughs> yeah you have to think about what you're purchasing and is it important to us and and what's going to be fun and everybody has to make that choice yeah but you can you know i work budget people so like you can look at your monthly income and you can look at a budget and you know decide on what's important in your life you know and make those choices and and save up for something and it's special a lot of kids they now, feel like you can't afford i had to work can save up to buy my first car at 16 and like everything I got I had to work for and save up it was never just purchase this thing on credit card or whatever you know so so we we've always um 
we've always worked hard and well, well, even I, the the car that we bought i i was like the when we first bought it it wasn't brand new it had some miles on it but it i mean i was just about that i said can we afford this he says yeah we've already been through this you know we've, we've looked at the numbers we both have jobs we have enough to to uh, you know and i was all freaked out about i was more worried about buying that car than i was the house that we bought but you know by then i'd made some payments and knew what life was about but, you know, but frugality though from a perspective that my stepfather was always going to die he was he was he was in he had a uh, condition illness bad. and so he was on the opposite side of things where he was like um just spend it like you're gonna die like you know like because he was because he was and so what i learned is like you know you could say you could spend your whole life being frugal and then die before you get to enjoy any of it. So, like, again, there's a balance there. Like, you have to be, just some of us have to be frugal, but yet don't forget that your window of life, it closes yeah. as we get older. Don't be afraid to spend some of it. I can guarantee you this, whatever I have saved when I'm an old man, I'm spending all of it. We're go We've are we gone to Tasmania, we're going on a cruise, we're going to, you know, like... We're going to live life, you know. Um, of course, if we have anything left, we'll we'll give it to our relatives. But because we don't have kids, there probably won't be anything left. <laughs> that is such a healthy perspective because, like, I, I don't know how it happened. But we've got this societal rhetoric of, like, you know, success being equivocated to money and income. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, well, that could be success, but it, it doesn't mean success, right? I mean, success is different for all of us right Right. it is it, it is whatever you think it is yeah we have toxic masculinity i feel like like this is toxic success they're caught up in it and, and, and so i get to talk to a lot of school groups that should at law of abuse and oftentimes it'll be a hundred fourth graders and i like to ask them i like what do you want to do when you get older and what really struck me is a lot of them <laughs> you know a lot of them want to be <laughs> they want to be you know, they want it. Whatever Basically, makes me a lot of money. I want money. to make a lot of money. I want to have a house with a boat and a car. And, you know, that's what I want. And I want to be a YouTube star. You know, It's the terrible YouTube and, culture, uh, though. You know, yes. like every kid, stars. Every kid <laughs> wants to be a YouTube star. And um, anyways, I think that all of us have to wrestle with that. They're going to have to wrestle with it when they get older and realize that, um, you know, money isn't everything. It really isn't everything until you don't have any, and then you realize that maybe it is most things, you know, because we have In to order to decide. eat, you know. <laughs> but isn't it funny that money's just a made-up thing? It's a piece of It's paper. a made-up thing we all it's agreed had we value. We agreed this has value. And you know, what? It's just, just, it's wacky when you consider it. I had a, I had a guy doesn't mean came up here um, one time. He, he had hiked up, and, and he was a millionaire. And he had made a series of companies. And what struck me after our conversation in the lookout was when he walked down, he says, man, I wish I could just be you for a couple of days. And I was like, well, he had houses on Kauai, on the big island. I'm thinking, well, crap. We could do a trade. Do a trade. Yeah. You know, Nobody you know. needs to know. But anyways, yeah, what a perspective. What a slap in the face for me. Like, wow. Like, you know, um, I've had all this frugality that we we're just talking about, and then somebody that has everything they need and all they want is a couple of days up here to read a book and stare out the window. You know, like mm, that's you know that's got to hit you. And then for me personally, um, one of the things part of our job we used to listen to nine one one calls um all, every day and and like hundreds. They've changed the frequencies now, so we don't hear it anymore. But we used we used to, to hear, hear it medical all. calls, so you would hear every day. Some and poor guy having a stroke. Hearing that was a everyday reminder that how short life, life is, is not that and how we could all just be at a at any point. One of us could have a stroke. You could have anything happen, you know. And like, um, it was kind of and some of it's kind of graphic it's that you hear. Disturbing. There, it's the paramedics the talking, is, so it it hits is it pretty hard. Is that your life window? All of our lives windows are going like this, and so. You know, you got to find that. I think you need to find that balance and find joy and find, you know, peace in your heart and and also be kind to other re people. Regret it comes back around. Regret will kill you and remorse. And you need to. And if you can find a way to let the past go and live in the present moment, I think that that will really 
which will help you achieve some peace in your life. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to be a more gentle person in my in my older years, a less bitter person, and a way more tolerant person. Because why would you want to get old and bitter? Let's get old and tolerant. I'm like, okay, whatever. You know, let it go. Let it go. Thank you so much for having a conversation. And uh, it's been a pleasure, my friend. Yeah, what a, the sun is reminding us. We have to. Uh, wrap it up thank you thank you guys really appreciate you, yeah. you coming and thank asking us. and i hope that uh, thousands of people may see this and if it positively influences them in a way then um you've you've done it and we've done that success just don't tell them where the address for this place is <laughs> <laughs>